everyone welcome back to my channel my name is Andrea and today I would like to share with you what I've read in the month of May but before I do I just want to mention one more time since tomorrow is June 1st we are starting our read-along for the pillars of the earth and if you would like to join us it is not too late this is a two-month read-along and I won't say any more on this, but if you still have some time to join in, if you'd like to, I will link down below the Goodreads group and all of the resources, including my announcement video. And when I say us, I mean me and the many people who have already joined the Goodreads group and Claudia from Spinster's Library, whose channel I will also link down below. The month of May was very interesting, and if you've seen my sort of bookish things I did this month, you'll see how there are many similarities between what I encounter in my daily life with what I choose to read, because they kind of bounce off each other, and it's sort of like my idea of being a mood reader is just to move like fluidly through life, and when things are thrown at me, to just be like, yeah, I guess I'll read that now. So one of the things that I started with this month was a master class uh, where Neil Gaiman was teaching writing and talking about his own works. I was fascinated in his short stories lecture where he talked about short stories and someone having told him that each short story is almost like catching the end of a novel or the end of something bigger and just having that pure positive essential things with everything else left out. And, and that made me go back to one of his short story collections. So the book I read was Trigger Warnings and in this book we have a mix of several stories written across the years. Now some of these short stories have been republished, reprinted as their own book. So one of them is The Truth is a Cave in the Black Mountains. And for this one if you get a chance to listen to the audiobook it is phenomenal. It's accompanied by musical quartet and it's just so magical and mythical and oh, it's just beautiful. So this is one of them. And then the second one is The Sleeper and the Spindle, which is a sort of Sleeping Beauty retelling. And it has these wonderful illustrations by Chris Riddell. Some of the stories that stood out to me this time around were not ones that I would have liked the first time, mainly because in this time, maybe it's been two or three years, I have learned so much about science fiction and fantasy history, mainly from Kalanadi's channel, but also because her books had then sent me to nonfiction works about some of these people, one of them being Harlan Ellison. One of my favorite collections of short stories in this book is called uh, Calendar of Tales, where uh, Neil Gaiman takes each month and then has like kind of a storytelling challenge like what's the coolest thing you've done in the month of January or what's a magical creature you've encountered in October and he would run with that idea and have this sort of fun experimental uh, storytelling technique where he just treats each month as a challenge of its own. And they're all very short, but fascinating. And he talks about Harlan Ellison and how he would write his short stories in the windows of shops or coffee shops or places without putting so much emphasis on this like persona of the writer kind of sitting in a secluded room uh, all by himself, just working away and it being complicated. This collection also has some other experimental tales that have interesting origins like uh, Cassandra or Letters to Cassandra. Oh, it's called The Thing About Cassandra. Um, Neil Gaiman discusses that it, when he was young he had this sort of imaginary girlfriend that he made up but all he had was her name. He didn't know much else about her and people soon forgot that she even existed. So he decided to take that concept and write an entire short story about this young boy who makes up a girlfriend named Cassandra. There are some stories in here that went over my head mainly because they had something to do with a culture I'm not really a part of, uh, mainly the Doctor Who thing. I am not a Whovian, but not by choice. I just never had the opportunity to watch any Doctor Who. But I know that Neil Gaiman did write a few episodes for Doctor Who, if not an entire season. I'm not sure. But one of these kind of is basically a Doctor Who episode written by Neil Gaiman. Um, and that went completely over my head. Another one was a retelling of Sherlock Holmes. A and there were some that were kind of accompaniments to his other novels like American Gods. So overall, I really enjoyed this story and I really enjoyed his more magical ones, obviously. 
but there's something uh, fascinating about his kind of creepy, morbid undertones of magic that happen in the real world, but in a very Neil Gaiman way. I really love this collection. And you know, some stories were just not for me, which happens with every short story collection. I then read two books by Robin Wall Kimmerer. One of them is called Braiding Sweetcrest and the other is called Gathering Moss. Uh, Kimmerer is an indigenous woman who is also a PhD and um, really studies e ecology and evolutionary biology. In this work, she sort of parallels the two worlds while capturing a sort of journalistic telling of her encounter with nature. Um, she will share with you what a strawberry means to her and why she feels that way and how a strawberry comes to become a strawberry. And at, sometimes you'll have the encounter of other wonderful vegetables like beans, squash, and corn, and she'll discuss them as the story of the three sisters and incorporate mythology or indigenous folklore into the concept of the vegetable and its history. And I loved the way she talked about nature. Everything she said was phenomenal. She made me appreciate trees. She made me uh, really respect mushrooms and uh, moss and everything in the forest. One of my favorite concepts was the idea of animacy and how at all times the forest is actually moving. Not just the living creatures that you think of like crawlies and ants and so on, but the actual plants in themselves are actively growing at all times. It might be slow, it might be invisible to the naked eye right away, but it's always constantly growing and changing. And that means everything, like the earth in itself and the forest is alive. And, and that's just phenomenal to think of that. And it's real life, you know, to think of our world having this incredible level of magic was something else. I loved this book. And this book focuses entirely on moss. And uh, I mentioned it feels more like a thesis because it's very focused. And it looks at almost every single species of moss that is interesting at least and goes into the details of each. For both of these I have made an entire video focusing on them in detail and I will share that video down below if you are interested in more on these books. Um, again if I do have to choose one it would be this one, Braiding Sweetgrass really love this one. I was then assigned a book to read because someone wanted to discuss a concept from this book with me, specifically the ending, which I cannot talk about because it's a spoiler, but it's Everything Everything by Nicola Yoon. Now I know this book has been circulating in the last two years on booktube mainly because it's a very popular YA book and it's been turned into a film, uh, so I'm not gonna really talk about it too much. It was a very quick read, uh, but its format made it much more accessible and quicker than I expected, mainly because it had a lot of illustrations and it took the form of emails and uh, back and forth exchanges. They were just very quick. So this was kind of like a one sitting kind of read. Um, it follows a young girl who has an illness and she is on lockdown similar to Bubble Boy and must be inside her apartment or her house at all times. And while inside she develops a romantic relationship with her neighbor Ollie and um, we get to see the complicated dynamics between her and Ollie, her and the world, and her and her mother. And she's incredibly smart, though I have to say, when a book starts off like this, I always go in a little bit skeptical. I've read many more books than you. Doesn't matter how many you've read, I've read more. Believe me. Okay. I finally finished book four of The Wheel of Time, The Shadow Rising. I've been budding reading this with Joe, and I promised I would do a video on The Dragon Reborn, book three, and this one. This one we divided in two months. So it's been a while. They're both interesting and they made me think about a lot of Arthurian themes, specifically because of the sword. Um, Rand has a sword that very much resembles the whole Excalibur story or the Welsh name for Arthur's sword, which I totally forgot the name of, but it starts with a C. I am very intrigued by where this series is going. 
and how these characters will continue to be developed because so far a lot has happened to all of them. Uh, nothing feels very high stake knowing that everything these people go through will they will survive mainly because they're the main characters so every time the, the main three guys are thrown through something I'm like ah they'll be okay so uh, that's been fun and in this one we learn about a completely new uh, type of people, the Aiel, and we get to be immersed in their culture and we get to learn about their loyalties, their preoccupations and their habitat, which at first I interpreted to be somewhat like Middle Eastern or Dune type. Yeah, I think this book was kind of like Silmarillion meets Dune. Uh, but Joe said that to him the landscape of the Aiel is more like Australia. And I don't know why, but that alone kind of shifted my thinking about the Aiel. I then read a book called Lanny by Max Porter. It is phenomenal. It's written in such an incredibly artistic way. It has all these voices and um, it follows this young boy who lives in a village and it's an old English village and his dad commutes into the city and his mother is a writer of horror and creepy books. This story is told to us through four voices. Uh, Lanny's father, Lanny's mother, Lanny's older teacher, who teaches him art, Pete, and the fourth voice comes from this spirit uh, who lives in this town, and it's kind of like the essence of stories and legends in that town, and he covers all of these voices of the village, whether they're made up of immigrant voices or English voices, and he just hears their conversations and his name is Dead Papa Toothwort. I have made an entire video review of this book. It's one of those books that deserves more discussion and I think in that review I've sort of emphasized the process of this entire book and some of the best qualities of each character. So if you are interested please check that one below but if you're just staying here, um, amazing book. You should definitely read it. You will love it, especially if you liked uh, The Berry Giant, uh, Monster Calls, and the stylistic choices made by George Saunders in Lincoln and the Bardo. After I read that, because the spirit sort of reminded me of the yew tree from A Monster Calls, I went back and reread The Monster Calls. <laughs> this book follows a young boy who is going through a very rough time because his mother is very sick. And every night, for three nights, he's uh, visited by this yew tree who is this ginormous, creature-esque thing. And each night the tree tells him a story. And one of these stories will teach him a lesson. It's almost like a proverb-like um, lesson-based story where you're supposed to extract something from each one of them. And some of the endings sort of, sort of shock the young boy. The ending is just beautiful. And there are so many lines in this book that made me think, like for example, you do not write your life with words, you write it with actions. What you think is not important, it's only important what you do. You are merely wishing the end of pain, the monster said, your own pain, an end to how it isolated you. It is the most human wish of all. There are also many lines on invisibility. I don't know why those stuck out to me the most, but the monster repeats again and again that being invisible is not the worst thing, or if no one sees you, the monster said, picking up its pace too. Are you really there at all? Um, it's a lot of that, um, are you who you think you are in your heart, or are you what other people think of you? And of course, my favorite line is when the tree says, I have come to heal you. It's wonderful. Lastly, because I have watched the movie Tolkien and was very disappointed, I went ahead and read more Tolkien things. So one of the ones I really wanted to read was this collection of Tolkien essays and shorter works, specifically his essay on fairy stories. If you haven't read on fairy stories, please read on fairy stories. It's Tolkien's greatest essay and it's him writing about fantasy. I mean, it's Tolkien himself, you know? You have to read it. It's phenomenal. And I was sent to this book not only after watching Tolkien, but also after doing the lecture online with um, Michael Drought, because he kind of alludes to a lot of elements from 
Tolkien's own essays into that lecture on fantasy and what fantasy meant to Tolkien. It was a phenomenal work to return to. I have flagged this many times, so really worth your time. And then I went to reread Humphrey Carpenter's biography of Tolkien. I got a chance to listen to this on audiobook as well. It's very nice and it just kind of covers all of Tolkien's life in brief chapters, um, taking it like a step at a time without getting too over the top convoluted. And it's, it's a good overview of biography. It's not super detailed, but it's a great beginning. So if you are looking for a good biography, I really like this one. Thank you very much for watching. Please share with me what you have read this month. And I will see you in my next video. Bye!